Good evening, friends. Good evening. Sierras. Hi, Lara. Good evening. Welcome to Britain, the quarantine island off the north coast of Europe, and probably a great place to start to talk about freedom and the future of freedom. I'm Lindsay Stonebridge, but I want to start by introducing my friend Lara Fagel. Um, I can't think of anyone better to talk about freedom with than Lara. Lara is a writer and a teacher who's often written about freedom, about its histories, about what we imagine freedom to be and the way we yearn for it, and how it's never what we think it's going to be. And I'm thinking here of two books in particular. Um, I'm thinking of her cultural history, The Bitter Truth of Victory, which was a book about the liberation of Europe after World War II. And the clue is in the word bitter. Freedom didn't pan out so brilliantly for a lot of people, especially women. And that leads me on to the second book, um, which is The Amazing Free Woman, which was a book that Lara wrote a couple of years ago. And it was a book about Doris Lessing, right? The South African writer. And it was a book about Lessing freeing herself from apartheid South Africa and freeing herself from the bad politics of male dominated left-wing politics. But it was actually a, women, a book about women in the early 2000s. It was about Lara's generation of women waking up to the fact that neoliberal feminism had actually put them back into a kind of conservative way of thinking and being about sex and gender and power and agency. And just this week, Lara has also published her first novel, The Group, which is based on the American writer Mary McCarthy's um, book about uh, women in the 1950s and 60s who turned out to be, guess what, not so free as they thought they'd be. Lara is one of the most fearless writers I know. Anyone who's read her books goes that she goes where a lot of us wouldn't dare to go. She really puts it on the line. And you need courage to think about freedom. You need a lot of courage to be free. So I think she's a fabulous person to talk about freedom with. And in fact, Laura, when you first called me and said, do you want to do this Friday night chat? Um, I said, first thing I said was, well, yeah, but can we talk about freedom, please? And she said, yes, Laura. Thank you very much, Lindsay. It's very nice to see you from our separate uh, lockdown studies. Um, Lindsay is a professor of humanities and human rights at Birmingham. She is the author of many books, most recently, The Judicial Imagination, Writing After Nuremberg, and Placeless People, Writing Rights and Refugees, which both focus on the creative history of responses to violence. And what I admire most about Lindsay's work is the way that she combines being a brilliant reader of text with being a very responsible citizen. The way that she looks to the past for answers in the present while remaining attentive to the differences between times and worlds. And the result has been a really dazzling series of books which are complex, clever and profoundly human. I'm looking forward in particular to Lindsay's next book which is going to be about Hannah Arendt who I think Lindsay in many ways resembles in ways that may become clear today. Um, both have a joy in and a commitment to the act of thinking that matters now more than ever and makes me particularly pleased to be doing this hopefully thoughtful event together this evening. Thank you, thank you, Laura. I think like a lot of people, we've been sitting at home working on books and writings and projects. But I know you're now working on D.H. Lawrence. When you told me this a few months ago, D.H. Lawrence is a British writer. Um, he's fabulous. He's kind of gorgeous, kind of not always gorgeous. Um, and he's very famous for pushing working class life, the life that no one really wanted to talk about into uh, modernist fiction. There's also, he's really famous for writing about sex and sexuality and female sexuality and for insisting on kind of energy and freedom of life. But I was surprised because for my generation of women, I mean, Lawrence has had a bit of a bad rap, especially for feminism, because his idea of what female sexuality might be sometimes didn't seem to be quite what some of us thought it might be. Um, so I, I was surprised. And then I've been thinking of you, Laura, hanging out in lockdown with Lawrence. What's it been like hanging out, well, rereading Dave Lawrence in lockdown Britain? Yeah, I mean, it's been on the whole, it's been on the whole great. I mean, I, yeah, it's funny because I think for me, Lawrence began when I first 
got really into him, um, I suppose a decade ago, he was a sort of guilty pleasure. And I thought, really, is this, is, am, I, am I enjoying him this much? Because I'd grown up with, with sort of generations of women saying, oh no, he, Lawrence is over. But then I, I realized that actually women in all those generations, there were kind of, there were sort of strong voices for him. So Doris Lessing and Angela Carter um, both really loved him and, and many female writers since. And so what began as a kind of, as a pleasure in the novels, obviously a pleasure in the sex writing, but also a pleasure in, I suppose his, his sort of vision, his, his very personal vision of, of freedom um, turned into something a bit in which I could sign up intellectually to the project, I suppose, um, where I think I do um, agree with him far, far more than I expected to when I started. And I think part of what I like about him is, is his oppositional thinking that for, for all those statements that sort of feminists or, um, you know, people on all sorts of grounds found problematic, he's always going to say somewhere else the opposite and often even in the same paragraph. Um, so, any, so if you get a novel in which someone's saying Oh, the new woman is is sort of doesn't understand um, the body, and she's sort of she's she's cut off, and she's willful, and she's she's trapped in her mind. You'll get someone else who says the opposite, and who who sort of takes down that man who's saying it. Um, and I think for me, I found that really helpful, but perhaps because there's quite a lot that that can't be said now, and somehow having someone a hundred years ago pushing ideas to their extremes, but also kind of tolerating the opposite is helpful but in, in relation to most of the ideas around modernity. So I think Lawrence, crucially for me, um, in some way sort of invented the modern world that, that so many of his ideas have kind of led to where we are now, but at the same time, he's resisting it. So I think, you know, in Women in Love, we get the modern woman, in some sense, he kind of creates her um, and and has, has sort of also just married her. But, um, but then he sort of hates her at the same time and can't quite stand it. And I feel like that comes up, you know, in so many areas in his relationship with the natural world, um, in his relationship with the idea of the end of the world that he's, he's kind of pushing forward, but then pulling back at the same time. And I, I find that um, helpful and, and, and sort of um, somehow affirmative. Um, but in, but sort of onto how he what it's like to be to be locked down with with Lawrence. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what he'd have made of where we are now, and, and we'll talk soon. I hope about Hannah Arendt and and and, and where we are with her. But I, Lawrence is a sort of tricky one because I think in, I mean he he wrote a lot about illness and death. He was ill throughout his life, and he was worrying away about what it meant to be ill. He saw it as a very psychological state, even when it was very physical, um, and was and sort of tend to blame people for their own illness, including himself. Um, and he thought that a crucial element of, of being a sort of full free person was, was to tolerate um, the, the sort of possibility of death, I suppose. So he says, we are not only creatures of light and virtue, we are also alive in corruption and death. Um, he said that in an essay, The Reality of Peace, which he wrote during the First World War, kind of thinking through what, what peace, what a sort of real peace might look like. Um, and so I think he might be irritated by, by our sort of fear of death and our sense that by, he might have felt that we hadn't fully incorporated it into our worldview and suddenly this illness comes along and we have to sort of, it, it's immediately intolerable to us. Um, I think in terms of the effects of the lockdown for sort of for, for privileged people like us in our, our book lined studies, um, he might have rather welcomed the retreat from the world. Um, he would have been certainly glad that that the kind of technology, the aspects of technology had quietened down, that there were sort of fewer cars on the road for a bit, that industrial processes had, had slowed. Um, he would have been pleased that we were kind of communing with nature. He'd have certainly been pleased that our children aren't going to school. He thought that schools were very pernicious and that most children shouldn't be educated beyond the age of about four. Um, and he was he thought work was a very bad thing. But I think despite all that, he'd have been really resistant to the lockdown and to the idea that particularly we're being told what to do by what in effect are, are minor bureaucrats, that there aren't sort of Laurentian leaders involved in, in this process, at least in Britain. Um, and I think he'd have hated the move towards technology. I'm not sure what he'd have thought about us uh, doing this tonight. Um, and hated the lack of in-person community that, that, that this is creating. So I've, I've sort of, again, it's been, 
the side of me that has sort of relished the quietness of, of this period has also been sort of holding myself to account through Lawrence, whilst also feeling that he would, he's sort of feeling alongside me and together we can observe the countryside in May or whatever it is. Like it, it's, it's a strange sort of duality. That's really, yeah, that's interesting. With that kind of retreat into the self though, I don't know. Um, I mean, Arendt likes that space too and she, she fights with herself. Constantly. Yeah. About liking that space. Yeah, I mean, let's, should we bring in Arendt at this point? Because I think she, she's got sort of in a way got more explicitly mm, to say about, mm, mm. about this. Well, actually, I was thinking about what you were saying, you know, you've got no kind of political leadership. And Arendt, I mean, Arendt stays with me all the time, but she has, there's one category that's always troubled me with Arendt, which is her category of what she calls the social. So she divided life through the human condition into two realms, the private realm, which is where we are, <laughs> um, except I'll come back to that because we're clearly not, we're right in the public realm at the moment. Um, and the public realm, which is the realm of politics, which is action, which is everything. To her because that's where we discover who we are in some ways and then she had a third category called the social i remember she's writing as writing after lawrence so she's the generation behind it but she's a 20th um century thinker and writer so she's watching modernity unfold and she's following people like weber understanding how it is that social life is emerging so she has this category of the social which I always struggled with when I read her as an undergraduate, because, you know, I come from the left. And so I thought, what do you mean? You know, she didn't like the social. She thought that what the social was doing was overtaking private life first, and that was bad. And public life, she thought that was bad. And I kind of used to flinch at this, you know, coming from the left, she said, you know, you know, what do you mean, lady? And the social's good. And I'm really beginning to understand something about the social that I didn't before um, in the last um, couple a few months mm. but before that the last couple of years what seems to have happened and I talked about this quite a lot with Julia Bell the writer is her categories of public and private in our contemporary politics have got reversed so everything that's private is now up for public consumption you know hello welcome to my front room <laughs> you can read my books you can probably see no you can't because I've hidden it under the desk all the rubbish I've left behind um you know various forms of my personal life. Um, and I'm performing my personal life and we all on social media and everything's performative and people are publicly shamed. So the private is really out there in, 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 in the kind of public realm. Whereas in terms of politics, everything that should be out there is private. So the deals that are being done, the kind of things that WikiLeaks uncovers, um, how government is being run, how decisions are being made, who is accountable. All these things have suddenly become very, very private. So you have this kind of reversal of roles, which leads me on to the social, because you used to call the social the blob, it kind of blobbed its way all over private life and, and you know, got in the way of politics. She said, you can't be political with this category of the social. And often what she was talking about, and she says quite often in her writing, she basically it's a fault of social science. <laughs> <laughs> social science and political science because they've made human life social life which is political life because we're arguing all the time we're debating we're having you know, discussions she's you know they've made those part of the life process which is to be administered to controlled and understood and what happened i think um in europe certainly in the uk but i think also um in in france and colleagues and people listening can fill us in on this was this kind of behavioral science became the determination of how we're going to respond to the pandemic. And yeah. that meant that all our, all our behavior has been, life it's for necessity, it's for life. And these are the things you, know, you can do, you know. So now the British government tells me who can use my bathroom, how many plates they can carry out in my kitchen, what they can eat with, um, where I can go, what I can do. Um, my life is tracked. I mean, you know, it's, you know, Arendt was the great writer on totalitarianism. And I think what she'd see now is a kind of, you know, totalitarian light. We wear it on our wrists, we walk around with it. Mm. Um, and what I happened? mean, just to come in on that, I think um, I've been sort of thinking about that in relation to Lawrence, that here he was kind of pontificating on everything. Yeah. Um, and that we sort of don't have, I think public intellectuals have sort of got a different, I mean, not that he quite was one, but Arendt certainly was, and have, have got quite a different role at this point because partly we're so reliant on scientists. Um, yeah. to kind of tell us what to do but yet scientists aren't used to doing that and so they're not quite doing yeah. it and actually it's yeah. and journalists yeah. weighing in 
Um, and is this, I mean, I think certainly Lawrence would have presented it and presumably. Yeah. Well, Arendt. also, I think, I mean, Arendt would have presented it for um, reasons like it's sinister <laughs> that, you know, we're suddenly not a, a, a group of political people in a nation state or in a union or whatever. We're a social blob and our needs to be administered in order to keep us alive. Okay, but we haven't had the argument about that. Mm. What I've really seen is she's saying what it does is it's vacate politics. So the kind of real political debates we should be having. Um, or the real political fights we should be having about inequality, the pandemic, making decisions what to do with human life, making decisions what to do with um, how to control it, are not being had because they were now completely subservient to this sort of behaviourist model. So you know, think, I mean, we never, I, I don't remember having in this country or in France the debate that said, oh, what should we do? We haven't got, we haven't got the resources because of austerity. People are going to die. Let's. Like, what are we going to do? Maybe the old people. Maybe the people in the care homes. We didn't have that debate. That just happened. Mm. Off, offline. It's a moral atrocity. I mean, it's an outrage, and it just, you know, it 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 just kind of happened. So that kind of squeezing out. Um, another thing. I mean, a few weeks ago, a couple of really nice scientists who were doing an interdisciplinary university project on coming out of lockdown. So we really want input from writers and humanities people because we need to know how people are going to behave. And I said, well, you're the, I'm talking to the wrong person here <laughs> because I think if, you, if you're doing politics based on how you think people are going to behave, I think we're going to have real problems here because I, I think that that is politically, that's un, un, that, that's, that is anti-freedom because it's anti-politics. Um, yeah, it's yeah no, all this sort of model-based thinking. Um, yeah. I mean, what do you think Arendt, sort of aside from the, the kind of the, the lack of argument that's got us into it, what would Arendt have made of, of the lockdown? Um, well, it, like Image, she did, she was a philosopher, so I think she, she, she always struggled between the demand to be public and have a public life and be political and loving the life of the mind. I mean, her last book was called The, the Life of the Mind. I think she'd have been profoundly worried because she always did say that... Um, elements of totalitarianism, you know, totalitarianism, state-led totalitarianism is gone, but elements of it are in the culture, elements are in, are in our politics, so you need to be very, very careful. And I think what she would have seen is a kind of continuation of um, a kind of lack of um, political participation mm. and will. On the one hand, I think she would have seen that. Um, and also, you know, the sort of stage, when I mean, she says in her essay, um, What is Freedom, which I was rereading this week because um, it's, and I recommend it, it's, it's absolutely brilliant essay. And I was thinking so many debates about lockdown in the West, it gets you so in privileged, privileged countries are about freedom or not freedom, my freedom to not wear a mask, my freedom to go and shock myself to death, my freedom to do this converses to your freedom. And what really became clear, she says in that essay, we have this, we've inherited the idea and it's a, it's a profoundly right-wing idea that you have minimum politics so you can have freedom. So we, it was a kind of Hobbesian version of the world. So we, we agree to be in a political state with one another. And we agree to give up certain freedoms so that we can be free and we don't have to worry about politics. And that model was really driving like Johnson's earlier thing, you know, British man's right to go to be free to go to the pub. And you hear see it a lot in America about you know, my freedom not to be locked down. And she said, no, actually, because freedom doesn't exist outside politics. Freedom is only enacted in politics. It's only when we're in the political world talking, debating and fighting with one another about the ways we live together and our moral responsibility. That is freedom. I mean, she also said that's kind of revolutionary freedom. It's that you know, improbable miracle when you grasp your, your freedom and mm. your moment. It's not in opposition to politics. Politics is freedom. So there's a kind of complete red herring about this fighting between, you know, I want to be free to be out of lockdown. What, what do you want to be free to do? It's like when we had the debate in Britain about Brexit, people would say, we want to be free, which I never got. I got why would Britain didn't want to be in the EU. I mean, that, that might be a you know, completely coherent, rational position, but because we want to be free is not a rational <laughs> position. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does also feel to me, like lots of the things that are going wrong at the moment are precisely because we, we don't have politics. Like they, yeah. you know, so much of it has been shut down. And that seems to be part of, of lockdown that they've, they, they've sort of shut down um, all the kind of modes of debate effectively. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, can you, I mean, 
it feels like the left is sort of broadly in favour of lockdown insofar as we're sort of protecting people from death. But yet we're also saying that we think it's been kind of a disaster for freedom in the sense of um, in the sense that Arendt uses it to, to mm. mean political debate. Mm. How does that can you sort of square those? I don't think I can square them because I think I think the, I mean some of the left will be pro lockdown, some of them will be anti lockdown. But I think it's a false dichotomy to say we're either you know, I mean so much of our politics is based on stereotypes. It's either nasty individualists um, who want to be free to kill everybody else, um, or namby pamby leftists who are so caring that we're 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 staying in. And I think that's a totally false opposition because actually when push comes to shove, the actual studies that have been done, so it doesn't actually map out. It's um, people who are, guess what, are really well educated, are quite happy for lockdown to end because they can protect themselves because they're rich and they're well educated from you the pandemic. You mentioned this the other day. Well, so which studies are those? I'm really interested in. Well, there's a study coming from King's that um, right. is going to be published soon. So it, it's actually, you know, it's the well-educated, it's the rich who are, are quite happy with the idea of, of, of lockdown ending because of course they are, because they can protect themselves. It's people who are more vulnerable, um, who, who, who who are more cautious. And for, you know, for reasons, especially as we've seen with um, BMAE, um, you know, it's a totally rational position. So it doesn't quite, yeah. I mean, the, the culture wars want to have, you know, you know, you know nabby pamby leftists and brave, bold economists, right, right wingers, but it doesn't actually pan out at all. And the thing that shifts people is, you know, deaths versus economy. Yeah, um, but in a way, I mean, wouldn't Arendt say, I'm sort of less good at this game than you are because I don't spend my whole day doing it. <laughs> but wouldn't you say that um, by preventing political debate, we're also like creating the problems that sort of result in all the deaths. So the lack of PPE, the kind of disastrous yeah. decisions being made are partly because we don't have politics, which is itself a result of the lockdown. And so then we need yeah. more lockdown because we're making so many bad decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't think she'd have it with politics, with big politics. I mean, where I mean, where I think she'd be, she'd look very kindly on DM, <laughs> is she did believe um, that politics was best done through voluntary associations, through like the Soviet councils, through I mean, America was her great model in a kind of imaginary mm -hmm. America, obviously not America that was, because it's what happens when people come together in a political community to make hard decisions. Yeah. And should that, we talk? Should we talk about freedom? Because actually, um, yeah. I'm, I was interested in. I was reading earlier. Lawrence's studies in American literature, um, thinking about Arendt, because I sort of love her idea of America. It's, I mean, it's, it's sort of partly the contrast between, between this sort of German woman and, and this kind of land of the free that she sort of finds herself in. And in a way, Lawrence is the same. He, he moved to New Mexico and, and had these sort of this, these landscapes to come up against and think about freedom through. Um, and his take on it is quite different from hers in that he says that he can't think of anything less free than America. Um, because he feels like everyone goes there to escape, but actually what they find is, is that sort of by escaping constraint, they make themselves less free. So he says, um, it isn't freedom, rather the reverse, a hopeless sort of constraint. It is never freedom till you find something you really positively want to be. Um, which for me, again, sort of resonated with the Arendt essay in that they're quite interesting. Perhaps it's less surprising in Lawrence, but it's a bit surprising in Arendt that her idea of freedom is so much the freedom to do something at a time when, um, you know, you get Isaiah Berlin saying that um, that that freedom from is is sort of where we should be at if we're if we're not totalitarian. And yet Arendt yeah, has yeah. this very um, positive version of freedom, which is really which coincides with Lawrence saying that that freedom is something you, to find something you positively want to be. And and maybe that I mean, which which for him came out of America. So I wonder if we I mean we, we mm -hmm. I guess this is about freedom and about America. Yeah. No, I always like the story of um, Arendt was a refugee and like um, many refugees and migrants today, when she came to the States from Europe, she was um, housed um, in a New England family um, to help her with her English. Um, so which was her third language. So she was sort of you know, training herself up to speak English. And she wrote these amazing, these hilarious letters saying, I love American politics and she loved it because of the kind of, um, um, you know, federal versus states, the fact that everything had to be fought out twice. Mm. 
Mm. Um, everything had to be earned. She and, and she really did love that revolution. The idea of making something possible, you know, is that is it de Tocqueville who says in the beginning was America? No, it's, it's Locke, it's Locke. Locke, John Locke says in the beginning was America. Right. And she loves all that. But she said, my God, it's so socially conservative. I have to smoke outside and the yeah, dress yeah. is the same and that's kind of normative and they go to bed early. And so all the things that as Europeans are like, Ugh. <laughs> and that's kind of that, that kind of tension that she meant. But I think she meant with freedom. She did have something which maybe is a bit like Lawrence. I mean, she had her idea of freedom is, and she, also she's borrowing, um, she's very influenced by Rosa Luxemburg in this, is it is that, well, she calls it something a miracle of improbability we don't think it's going to happen and it, but miracles do happen and th that kind of moment where people grab at freedom by enacting freedom is so important to her so the two examples i always to use the sheep there's, there's a reason why there is a mural of hannah arendt's book on revolution on a wall in hamra in beirut um you know she would have um you know what do we think about what she'd like now the, book, the, the kind of um, the Arab Spring uprisings would be absolutely that moment where you people just came together to think we can change this reality. We are going to change this reality. I think Black Lives Matter over the last couple of weeks has mm. actually embodied that spirit. Things that you know, when when um, there was a, a statue of a slaver in Bristol here in England that was actually tossed into the harbour, I just thought she would have just like, yeah, that's what I mean. Who thought that would have happened? I mean, you know, it's just like people yeah. remade that reality themselves. But it also sort of comes from nowhere. I mean, the other quote she used to use was from René Char, the French writer who was in the resistance. And he said, after the war, he said, um, our inheritance came to us with no testimony, which why, what he meant is you don't get a how to do a revolution. I mean, some revolutionaries do get a how to do a revolution. That's why Arendt and René Char would have thought they'd gone wrong. And then, in, in this resistance, they just, it was political action. It was making community, it was making things happen. And there was no guidebook, they just did it. So that's what she really wanted to see in what she admired about the states that it, it, you know, people have made it out of nothing. So you think she would have been keen on the statue toppling? I don't know about the statue toppling because she would have probably been me about, I mean, she didn't like violence. She didn't, mm. And she certainly, she, I mean, the thing she said about people like France Fanon and um, I mean, the, the, there's a racism to her language about black violence, which is deeply disturbing. Um, she would have seen that moment, although she was, you know, she, she was pro civil rights and um, would have been pro Black Lives Matter. Mm. Um, I think she would have seen that moment as a, a moment of remaking the world you live in. Because yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It, yeah, yeah, through a principle of equality, through that this is just not on, yeah. this just has to end and we're going to make it end. And there we go. Um, I, mean, I think Lawrence her. would have been quite keen on the, the statue toppling. Yeah. Um, I think we're all quite keen actually on the statue toppling. <laughs> Having said that, Lawrence is never quite keen on anything. He was either very keen or very against. So I think, let's say he would have been very keen on the statue toppling um, insofar as he was quite signed up to violence um, mm. and thought that conflict was was part of life and that sort of comes back to his oppositional thinking that everything has to always be be sort of teetering off its extreme sort of other and and so I think he, he was kind of flummoxed by the first world war because he really hated it as a war and thought it was pointless and over kind of bureaucratized but also didn't want to be seen as a pacifist because he really thought that we needed violence yeah. um, to function as a society and then he kind of caught himself up in sort of trying to decide which kinds of violence he could tolerate and decided that it would be okay if we all had knives, but no, but no kind of weapons of mass destruction. And then he, he wasn't sure about guns. He thought maybe a sort of single firing pistol would be okay. And it's coming back to the body. It's sort of violence that comes from the body as in the kind of great, mm -hmm. you know, wrestling mm -hmm. scene and women and love is, is a sort of form of catharsis and energy and, and indeed freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the statue toppling could, could be part of that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I think the other thing Mina Rent would have really loved about that moment is, um, well, or the whole Black Lives Matter would have been civil disobedience, uh, which she was a great supporter of civil dis disobedience as, as against, you know, moral, my individual choice, you know, my moral conscience yeah. says I will not do this. I mean, she, she wouldn't have much time for that. She says there's only point about being civilly disobedient. And in the States, she thought that was the spirit of the law in the States, which was to, you know, you, you, you're, that you're there, you're making a new nation out of agreement that you're going to be bound by laws you are making 
and if mm. they if if that government is like messing around with those laws or if it's inequality then of course you have in the way you have to be civilly disobedient but she liked the group because it's like this is where the where political meaning comes it comes together from what we do as collective action when I mean, individual acts of conscience don't interest her mm. because they're kind of I mean, that's what, yeah. right? <laughs> we could talk a bit about the individual because i think for i mean that's it's certainly something i've been thinking about in relation to lawrence as well that he I mean, it, Arendt's interesting in that she, she sort of in her freedom essay, she says that she hates the idea of inner freedom, that she doesn't like people sort of thinking through things on their own on individual terms. But yet she seems to have a strong idea of the individual, which maybe you could talk about. But with Lawrence, I think he, in a way, everything is about the individual bit fully expressing themselves. And so we're meant to go deeply into our unconscious, but use that to be in, to, to be fully ourselves. So he talks about the poppy in its redness, expressing itself fully as an individual. And we're all meant to find ways to do that, to work out exactly who we are and then to be ourselves fully. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, he hated the notion of personality um, and any sort of self-consciousness about um, personally expressing yourself. He thought that was vain and unnecessary. And so the idea of everyone being fully themselves like the poppy in the field is that we are then going to form communities in which we kind of got rid of false personality and self-consciousness and um, and are able to interact. And then it does become in a, in a way about the collective. Um, and I wonder how, you know, how would, how does she fit in with all that? Does, how happy is she with personality? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, I mean, there's a part of it, she, she would have said, yeah, okay, there's in a bit of you, which is just your, you're in a bit of in a bit but I think she also did really think about the the kind of joyousness of being alive was in our relationships with other people mm. that's that's who we get made so she she wouldn't have liked the kind of you know will to power um you know stamping I, I want to be free to be who I am you know <laughs> because yeah. I, it, yeah because she actually did I mean really believe in a kind of um social love um I mean love of the world because she thought the you know the kind of meaning we have comes from our inter in our relationships with other people, even when we, we don't know them. I mean, she always has this idea of you know, the great storybook of mankind. We don't know. Every time we speak, every time we do something, when we're going to make an action, um, it might, you know, it's intentional, but we don't actually know it, our effects. But that that is the story. That that's kind of mm. kind of the the history. And I think um, I that's sort of true for Lawrence as well. That this idea of sort of being free to to be oneself is very different from sort of being free to express oneself. And yeah. it's a self that's kind of emptied of, of sort of external selfhood in a way that, and yeah. I liked her, her thing in, in the Freedom Essay that a free act is not one that comes out of the will, but is one that kind of expresses a quality. So you could express yeah. courage in an act. And I think that's really true for him that he, he kind of hated any sort of willed action um, and wanted us to, to sort of channel, um, he talked about the, the sort of, the good kind of, he had bad bad forms of will and good kinds of will, and the, the good kind was sort of that you were on a river flowing and it just steered you on it. Um, and in a sense then the world is sort of being expressed through your, that in being fully yourself, you are expressing the world, mm. um, which seems to, again, sort of resonate. For her, I yeah. don't know I'm sort of forcing them onto each other. I do. <laughs> yeah, I think it does, but I mean, there's also that kind of, you know, I think Arendt would have been very well aware of the kind of who gets to speak and to have that. Mm -hmm. that um, which again, you know, going back to the pandemic and thinking again about lockdown and what's happening, um, you know, especially when we've had this conversation before around gender. Mm. Um, race is one one part of the conversation, but gender is the other. You know, I think Jacqueline Rose wrote a very interesting essay on Albert Camus at, um, at the beginning of the lockdown, where she pointed out, and she wasn't she hasn't been the first to point out that you know the women in in Camus are in lockdown all the time, <laughs> and they've always been in lockdown. You know, we know that um, you know we, we keep on saying well crime's gone down, and, and must we say no, it hasn't. Domestic crime is like you know rocketing across Europe everywhere. Mm. Um, um, it, and the model of who gets to do the caring, who gets to stay at home. We know, you know, in terms of you know, who's been hit hard by the hard, who's going to be hit hardest by the economic hit we're going to take. I mean, it's going to be 
women, it's going to be um, um, younger people, it's definitely going to be black and Asian minority people. So it's like, we can want to be free, but you know, <laughs> Um, we're, we're in a situation right now where the forces of, um, you know, even getting together in a kind of socialist pro Laurentian project to decide what kind of freedom we'd like is so, to use a kind of horrible neoliberal word, challenged. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, in fact, when you first asked me to do this talk on freedom, I was a bit resistant, partly because I sort of came away from writing my lesson book, which was all about freedom, thinking I didn't really believe in freedom as a concept mm. somehow that it did it felt like once you start thinking about it it's a word that can't quite hold its own that it's sort of that as soon as you sort of seek freedom somewhere it sort of eludes you and that it's always going to be the next stage on and I quite like Arendt's idea that actually freedom is in action um but then I wonder if is there a sense that everyone that because it's quite a nebulous empty word everyone sort of says what is freedom and then they just put their favorite thing in it so for Lawrence it's it's being oneself and it's going deep into one's inner self and for a rent it's politics because that's you know an action yeah. those are her things um i wonder how helpful it is as a word in the in kind of thinking towards like you know the future um should we think about the, the future in terms of freedom or is it more yeah. helpful to think in other ways i think it might one of the ways maybe think about it is that is a word we've got and it's quite useful and to try and grab it back from that false dichotomy that says you are free when you are free of politics or free of social obligation or free of relations to other people so, so to free it from that kind of mm. right wing um because it's, it's, it's kind of rubbish i mean it's like you know so so you know <laughs> you know freedom not to be not to be bothered by politics you know minimal minimal politics yeah. minimal state um freedom to um so but it is a word that is quite useful um, to put out there. I mean, I was, thinking, I was thinking about, for example, the kind of debates we've had, well, not debates, fights um, in terms of the, um, the EU, um, or there are others, but the EU has been particularly shocking um, in its um, contravention of non reformant and it's pushing pushbacks in, in the Mediterranean and it's, 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 decri it's criminalization of humanitarian action, which has happened over the last two years. And a lot of the lawyers who've been working on that I'm realizing it's really quite hard to fight within current human rights laws if you're fighting um, around the laws of refugee protection, which are there, but they're pretty minimal as they are. And, and, and we're in a culture where they're not being, um, you know, they don't have any value because they're being, mm. human rights are being trashed. And so what happens, and I think Glenn Law were trying to do some work on this, if we use the freedom of conscience of, of which you can do under law of the helpers, it's, it's my freedom to act it's my, you know, my freedom to act in regard to my conscience means that I'm taking that boat out and I'm picking those people out of the water. Mm. I mean, and so it's that kind of utilization of, of freedom to do a different type of um, political work without, you know, falling into the Laurentian um, you know, freedom, freedom as well, or indeed, you know, I, I would love a political and public realm like Arendt describes it. But and what would that you're look like? have to so fight to get it. <laughs> like... What would you know? What would the sort of active life look like for an Arendtian in the current circumstances? What What should we be kind of? Well, I think it's uh, yeah, it's like it it is doing is doing voluntary associations. It, it would be politics on a. Right. I mean, what she says in the essay is so like she says, you know, the problem is sovereignty. If once the will and politics got based on sovereignty, it was kind of bad news because we then got into a notion of all politics has to be power or sovereignty has to be power. So claiming sovereignty by definition is oppression. You're gonna to have to press someone else. You're gonna to have to do something to something else in order to get your sovereignty. And she yeah. even says in a funny picture, even if you talk about my own will, we're usually battling with, if we talk about, you know, I've got to, where's my willpower? You're already having a battle with yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. So to be sovereign of yourself, you're already having to shut down you know, like whenever I say, where's my willpower? Why don't I get up and doing better politics? And where are, why aren't I doing this? You think, because I like lying in bed reading my book. I'm already squashing the bit, the lazy side of me that might be actually quite helpful. Um, yeah. No, I think so I think, like, yeah, so imagining a non-sovereign politics, which I think a lot of people are imagining a non-sovereign politics and doing a non-sovereign politics because they have no choice mm. at the moment. So it is the small, is the collective. And I was thinking, you know, as you, you were talking about, about lockdown, the first people I knew who locked down 
A lot of people locked down independently of their governments, by the way. But one of the people who certainly did it was a um, people of um, Badawi refugee camp, which is in northern Lebanon, which is a Palestinian refugee camp, which is very, very poor. And UNRWA, the United Nations, don't treat you really for anything if you're over 50. I mean, that's it. You're on their own. Your own. And so when the people of Badawi saw the COVID coming, they locked themselves down. They put themselves into siege. They did it themselves. Um, and it's not because they wanted to be politics or wanted to be Orentian or wanted to be anything else. It's just they knew that if it got in, that would be it. I mean, that would go through that camp. Mm. And it, it's just unthinkable. But they were at their local level making decisions, you know, and you could be sure there would have been, you know, as there always are, anyone in politics knows, you know, you're fighting with one group, wants to do this and this other group, and it's all, I mean, nothing about politics, it's very, very tiresome. Um, that's why it's very, very good. But that, that she would have seen as good politics, right. as opposed to, yeah. yeah. And that's why she always thought party politics especially when she was writing in the States in the 1970s. So it will always fail because at some level parties are just interested in their own power and representing themselves. Mm. There's always going to be a moment. This is a moment where it doesn't really, you know, um, in, in, in Britain, certainly, and in, in in, 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 to extent France and America, there's lots of things about the pandemic um, and lots of things about austerity and lots of things that just don't map onto party politics. And that's for a very good reason, because the political questions and the kind of decisions that people are making are happening elsewhere. But it's whether that's a kind of failure of, you know, whether we then give up on party politics altogether and, and sort of commit to the local and the communal, the community mm. level. Mm. Um, which it can be both. I mean, what, what, what we yeah. need is a kind of transnational or kind of political organisation which works with the local. <laughs> and, <laughs> but yeah, it's transnational. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because Lawrence too, I mean, he, he, he gets quite a lot of a bad press for sort of not particularly liking suffragettes. But his point about suffragettes was that he was very happy for women to have the vote if they wanted to, like alongside men, but he'd really rather no one had the vote because he thought we should be organizing ourselves in communities rather than in, in, in nations in that sense. Um, which again is a kind of, helpful unhelpful thought it's sort of it's not necessarily a recipe for the yeah. future but it's it's a sort of as we say many things that kind of helps you question what you have and with with a rent um i do i mean sometimes like reading the freedom essay it, the way that she talks about politics makes it sound it can make it sound like lots of very clever people having great discussions um, and and yeah. sometimes I think, well, what's that going to like? How how will that take us forward to the future, given where we are now? And it does. I, I think what you're saying, in a way, is that that part of that will be through kind of voluntary organisations and smaller scale politics, yeah. somewhere between the kind of brilliant conversation and the the national politic political model. Yeah. Um, but that's what you've heard a lot of people say during. Um, um, COVID and the lockdown is like, you know, people have consistently said I mean, that the kind of community work that's suddenly being done has become visible in a way that it hasn't. And I've often been asked, does that, doesn't that give you cause for hope? And I said, well, mm. yes, but yeah. Yeah. Should we bring in, we've, we've sort of got a couple of questions. We've yeah, we've got, we've got about, um, about digital realms. Yeah. Um, I mean, the digital is a sort of interesting I've been, you know, wondering what these writers would make of our digital lives, um, and certainly neither of them are very keen on technology. Yeah. Arendt had her vision of sort of enormous computers taking over yeah. and talking us. And look, um, yeah. And Lawrence had his vision that um, that we were losing. I mean, he he thought that it was fine to use a machine to make a table that could be useful and could save us from working, but as soon as you're using machines to kind of create their own desires, um, you get lost because you're kind of allowing technology to take yeah. things over. Um, yeah. And we certainly are taken over by, by Zoom and, and co. Um, and maybe it's kind of distracting us from the fact that we don't, maybe we need to fight harder for sort of real community at this point and, yeah. and we're sort of allowed not to by technology. Mm. I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, two things there. I think that that's that's how she also said you know the trouble is that we've got you know it, she was writing in the 60s so she's talking about the man on the moon the trouble is our capacity to imagine technology is outstripping mm. our capacity to be human in response to it so I think that's definitely what's happening 
um, but also down to technology um, as you know the next frontier in in the colonization of human bodies. I mean, it's just like AI. I think is she she would be very profoundly scared. Yeah. Um, about I mean, if you look at we have a we have a system now called Track and Trace. Uh, anyone anyone got alarm bells going? <laughs> Um, here, and lots of people are resisting that. And they're not resisting it out of a libertarian right-wing politics. They're, they're resisting it um, all because they're quite happy for other people to die because they've been sneezing all over them or, or, or whatever. Um, it is that kind of technologization. Um, mm. and, and the language that was used about it is like, you know, if you, see, you know, download the app or slap something on your wrist, um, then you can be free. You know, go back because um, psychic music has just asked like what what conditions do these terms stop using it's a brilliant question um, um but so you can be free you know <laughs> free by letting us track you all the time know what you want know what your desire is get the algorithm to track down your desire so it goes back to that point you know before about everything that's private is suddenly yeah circulating and what do we make i mean how useful is it to us to have thinkers from the past who are preoccupied with the problems of technology. I mean, in a sense, everything they predicted has come true, that it, the modern world really is as bad as they sort of, as bad and as technological as they feared it might be. But I think like for me with, with both of them, but, but particularly with Lawrence, it's kind of, you can't just say, okay, what he really wants is for us all to go back to the beginning of the rainbow, to go back to that sort of wonderful rural life in which families sort of went from generation to generation with quiet rhythms, living alongside animals. Um, that he, there's such a pressure towards change and towards modernity and a sense that nothing can ever be still and that we're always sort of pushing on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, so how can we like reconcile those and, and does it, how can we be people who sort of embrace change whilst also bemoaning it? <laughs> Yeah, but it's also, I mean, like technology can be, I was always thinking, you know, that, um, the great invention of the bicycle um, and what that did um, for, um, for, so I've just got this great, my great comment here is like, I've sneezed and such for 57 years. My state of being is my own damn business. Absolutely. Um, um, but, you know, the bicycle was a bit, bit of technology that looked great, but actually transformed um, mobility and, and helped um, transform the suffragette movement because women were finally mobile, you know. So mm -hmm. it's always a, a kind of double thing. I think the scary thing goes back to a point you made earlier, which is the kind of existential angst the West went into when, plant, when, we, when they realised they couldn't control COVID. Mm. There was, you know... There was not going to be a cure. There was not going to be a, a fix that science yeah. couldn't do it. And also science couldn't predict our behaviour. Yeah. Either. I mean, it's interesting because I think Lawrence would see, you know, the numbers of people dying in the West as as the kind of sign of the sort of pre-existing illness here, in a way. That it's, um, and he has an essay, in fact, The, the State of Funk, um, where he <laughs> talks about the sort of real danger being our, our tendency to panic. And it was interesting. Uh, did you read about that sort of amazing Carolyn... Um, health minister who managed, I think, in the time that Britain, that the UK had 40,000 deaths, 40,000 deaths, they with um, half the population had four, um, with very little money and with, a, with it sort of seemed to illustrate the ways in which we're sort of enacting yeah. our own decline. Yeah, um, yeah. But also expecting that kind of, you know, the language of um, behaviourism and rationality and focus groups. I mean, and, and in Britain, we're not alone. What you've got is a kind of politics which is working with a kind of hodgepodge of bad tech, deep tech, um, behaviorism, and focus groups, which is not a politics, it's a kind of anti politics, mm. um, which is being enabled by this kind of technology. I mean, the, the, the kind of stuff that came out as coming out um, about you know, the, the, the kind of manipulation. Um, around elections, around well, Brexit, but also the US, about, uh, just uh, elections are going to be, you know, having having kind of slightly trashed um, representational politics for a little bit. I don't want to go back. I mean, that's that that's that's where the political fight is 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 now um, on on voting behaviour. Um, I wonder if we should talk just a bit about sort of pulling away from freedom in a way about about why we're having these peculiar lives in which we. <laughs> We sort of live so intensely alongside thinkers from the past. Um, I mean, how did you find yourself 
having this life with a rent. With a rent? Yeah. I think it came later. Um, I think, I don't know, oh God, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I read her as an undergraduate. She's very unpopular then because she was seen to let down the left and she was right. I remember a very well-known and actually someone I quite respect his work, a Cambridge philosopher said to me 10 years ago, I don't, I don't know why you're worrying, worrying about, you know, it was over a wine, um, why you're worried about Arendt Lindsay, she's a um, journalist and a housewife. Um, but I think for me, having been trained through kind of critical theory, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a child, a student of the 80s, it was the moral clarity of her thought mm -hmm. that makes her a constant companion. As opposed to the political theorists, as opposed yeah. to the... Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she would also, I mean, uh, um, she just writes as an outsider. She was an outsider. I mean, she, was, she was a Jewish woman who didn't, you know, didn't play the game. She was a refugee. She was a stateless person. Mm. Um, she didn't fit in with the right and she didn't fit in with the left. And she, I mean, actually, you know, people, I, there was this sort of Twitter fight a few, few months ago about, well, she'll never have got a job in a philosophy department. And you think, well, she wouldn't have wanted it, actually. <laughs> she, wasn't, she wasn't interested in being a philosopher. It she may was not be everyone's chief aspiration. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I don't think I actually cares. <laughs> like, um, um, but I think, I think what she did, going back to your question, is my real answer to this. I mean, probably why I love Lawrence as well when I was young. Lawrence and Sartre. And those writers, I love them both because they were, they were outsiders. And they gave you permission to be um, an outsider. And that, that is still, I mean, a university life is one thing, but the kind of institutional outsiding of people who the institutions don't think should be there mm. is still very, very strong. And I kind of thought it had gone away and finding a rent, refinding a rent made me um, think about that. And yeah, a position to think from. Right. And do you feel identified with her in that? Do you have arguments with her? How does it... What, what kind of relationship? I have arguments with her all the time. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it's just like, um, but a lot of the time I'm just trying to catch up with her. I mean, the other thing, she's a very good, you know, she just, because she's an outsider, she does the kind of, she's not an autodidact, but her, her husband, Heinrich, was. And I think like a lot of those, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of first generation into university. I didn't go, I went to North London Polytechnic. I'm not Oxbridge or any of those things. Um, is that she's really good because she's reading very, very carefully and very, very slowly because she hasn't got the rest of this stuff mm -hmm. to back her up. Mm -hmm. And I identify very strongly with that, like all of us who kind of want to read, want to have ideas, um, is, you know, you tend to do it painfully and slowly because you didn't go to the school that taught you how to bullshit. <laughs> um, although she was very, you know, she was very well educated, you know, she was in a, mm. a Jewish family that really believed in the Jewish enlightenment, et cetera, et cetera. But she had that, the, the kind of um, integrity um, and awkwardness and kind of um, contrarian. She's a kind of contrarian and women usually, if women are being contrarian, they're usually praised for being sort of witty, sarcastic and kind of sexy in their contrarianism. Um, but she, you know, she kind of resisted that. Mm. So yeah, there is a kind of, there's always, I always want to teach a course for universities for, you know, for students before you're taught to fall out of love with your writers, you should be able to fall in love with them. So I always thought it'd be great to have a first year course called Sex and Death and One Day You're Going to Die. And it would have Lawrence. And yeah, no, and and I, mean, I, think, and... I think the last kind of decade for me, I guess, has been a process of allowing that to happen again. Like I feel it was certainly knocked out of me educationally that, that yeah. you weren't kind of allowed to really just go for it and sort of identify yeah. with writers and, um, and live through them and live with them as voices in your head. And all, I mean, which has been particularly intense in, in sort of different ways over the last few years and, and the lockdown sort of really, when you're yeah. reading one writer, it really brings it out. But I, th I think that's changing. I think the other thing, going back to what Arendt would have liked now and Black Lives Matter, is she really believed in new beginnings. Um, and so she was a re really strong supporter of the student movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so natality, what she called natality or birth, the new beginnings were the thing for her. So you have you know, Danny Cohn Ben saying she was ter terribly supportive and not just because she liked young people I and mean, everyone who teaches young people thinks they're great, but this generation, the kids who are on the streets at the moment, that's where my hope is. I think they're fabulous and it's coming out of their 
reading and understanding and their crossness and their imagination and their sense of a freedom that's not available to them. And I haven't seen anything like this um, yeah, um, for, for a long time. So I think, I mean, that, that moment, the, the, she used to call the students the new people. And I think that the new people are reading like that again, you know. Right. Yeah. They might not be there. They might be reading Fanon, they might be reading Avrent, they might be reading Yanis Varoufakis, um, but they are reading and they're reading not because they want to be better people or more thoughtful, but they do want to do all those things. They're reading because they'd like the world to change. I really get that sense uh, more strongly than I, and I've been teaching for 30 years um, right now, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's an inspiring uh, point at which um, should be. I was going to say to so Daniel, Daniel, there's a portable Hannah Arendt. Um, Daniel's just asked which of her books to, to recommend. That's really good. And um, to start with, it's got all the kind of collections um, uh, and and things things like that. But also this collection of essays, which you can't see, um, which is called Between Past and Futures. Um, and we have a question also, we've got five minutes from J.O. Given that in a real democracy, equality should prevail, how to curb individual liberty to achieve its goal? Mm. Uh, Lawrence would have liked that question. He would. Well, I mean, it sort of brings us back to Isaiah Berlin, I guess, who, who yeah. thought that the real danger was precisely making that choice and that that's what led yeah. to totalitarianism, that if you... Um, that the freedom to freedom to be equal um, necessitates uh, curbing freedoms, um, and he thought that that was in the end too dangerous. Um, and I I was sort of grappling with that with Lessing, uh, who was a communist and and sort of yet believed fervently in freedom and had to really deal with that question of. Um, how both to believe in freedom and how to believe in, in sort of some curtailment of freedom. And she managed to, I mean, it's partly again about rhetoric. It's it, again, it's the fact that freedom is such a kind of nebulous world that you can start saying, well, actually there's more freedom in being equal because freedom from want is, is itself freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where she got to. And I, yeah, and it, perhaps it, it's it's sort of largely semantic that it kind of depends on definitions of freedom, and we can quite easily shift from one to another. But what? I'm yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's still the spits of Hobson that you know, we, we we come together in society and trade freedoms for security, um, and so that's not so much curbing individual liberty as saying this is the deal, right? <laughs> because as Hobbes said, otherwise life is nasty, British and short, and just doesn't happen. So there's always going to come a point, and these are the arguments we've had to have in the UK, that if you're signing up to democracy, you have to go for democracy. I mean, that's how, if, if that's how we're going to do it, that's how we're going to do it. And I, I see that, you know, I, I say this as, you know, a, a Remainer um, and a middle class Remain Splainer. But, you know, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> um, so I think the kind of individual liberty versus society is a full, false dichotomy that. Um, you know, we really need to reimagine what freedom means within the context of people living together. Yeah, and certainly and Lawrence, I think, would have, I mean, I would have just said that the notion of individual liberty was really false and that it's predicated on, on a notion of the individual that's itself false because it implies sort of free will and it implies that we can will ourselves yeah. into interactions that in fact aren't free because we're trapped by, yeah. um, because the will is itself a trap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's what she said. I mean, there's a one point where um, Raisinet has just um, said quite, you know, is real freedom a matter of freedom from more freedom too, which is a much better way of putting it than I've just been putting it. But there's that point where real freedom should come together, Arendt says, when the I can comes together with I will. And so because I can do something, I will do it. So I can campaign to more, pay more taxes. I, 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 I can make this protest. I can get out there I yeah. can do that work. Therefore I will, because I know it is the right thing because I am acting on my principle. My principle is one of equality, equal property. Yeah. Equal. I mean, I think that takes us back to, to, to Lawrence's statement in the American essays, which is never freedom till you find something you really positively want to be, which I think mm -hmm. is, is both individual and collective. Um, yeah, I think we're both on the side of, 
of freedom too. We think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like more of it, especially now, because we can't get out of Britain and no one's allowed in. <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> I think on that note, we should call it. Yes. But I'm very glad to have done it and to see you, Lindsay. And thank you yeah. to um, 25 as, as kind of absent, mysterious hosts. But who will? Who will yes, that? thank you, DM, and thank you all the um, chat people who've kept us from waffling too much. Thank you. Bye.